Dear participants, dear friends, it is a very special honor for us for this 24th Global Digital Encounter to uh, discuss the question of vintage brands and the new bad face conundrum. Well, this uh, 24th Global Digital Encounter is organized, as all the previous one, by uh, FIDE in cooperation with the Transatlantic IP Academy and thanks to the support of many entities all around the world. We are happy and honored to gather participants from everywhere and to gather exceptional speakers today who are uh, high, uh, highly qualified specialists on the very topic of uh, vintage brands. We all know that uh, brands, after having experienced some times of glory, often have been phased out, but they still live on consumers' memory. And time after, someone rescues them and they have a second successful life, or they may have a second successful life. How should this brand be considered? Should the marks be cancelled? Is there bad face in the use, uh, in the second use of this, in the second life of these brands that have become vintage brands and again get back glory with, within the same classes or not? This is a key issue that we shall review today all together for this 24th Global Digital Encounter. So uh, we wish you, uh, we wish our speakers and moderator much success. I wouldn't wish to keep the floor longer and I would wish to give the floor right now to uh, the uh, coordinator of uh, our uh, Global Digital Encounters under uh, the direction of Professor uh, uh, Desantes and myself. So I would wish to give the floor to uh, coordinator Javier fernandez Laschetti. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Laurent, and thank you all for coming. Thank you to the speakers and moderator. Yes, indeed, this is a very fascinating question. Um, you must remember that uh, trademarks are what my colleague and best friend, Manuel De Santes, Professor De Santes, said, emotional innovation. So a brand has some, something emotional on them. So that's why although some of them can disappear from the legal arena because you haven't paid the taxes, you haven't uh, used, etc., they will remain in the minds and the emotions of the consumer. So uh, the question is this one. I mean, what, that trademark can be occupied by a third party. Is that bad faith? Is that uh, attribute? Is, uh, what is this? So we have a, a very a nice group of specialists in that uh, in that field that will explain and we discuss among them all that questions and will give us light. So I would like to bore you more with my thinking on this. And uh, Anke, I will pass you the floor. Thank you for coming. You know that you belong to a community and uh, you're very welcome to participate in this in the Cantos. Anke, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, inviting all of us to this uh, really interesting topic. I'm, I'm really happy that we have so many good speakers today that can uh, help all of us to understand this topic a little bit more. Um, we want to discuss ideas and also uh, provide maybe, uh, you know, answers, but we cannot be exhaustive. This is really the idea to have a good conversation um, about this topic. Um, and your questions will and can be uh, posed um, in the chat. And I would very much in li like to invite the audience to do so, so that uh, at the end or, well, actually in the middle of this uh, encounter, we will uh, look at them and also in, and answer them as much as we can. Uh, so this is uh, uh, some formal um, announcements. So let's now maybe go directly to this fascinating topic of vintage brands and the bad faith conundrum. Uh, vintage uh, sounds fantastic. It's like uh, it's a bit old, but also nostalgic and some sort of glamour around it. At least that's what it uh, does to me. But um, when we look at it from a legal perspective, maybe Verena, if I can ask you first to explain to us and the audience, what do you think vintage marks um, should be defined as in a, in a legal sense as well? And what the problem actually is? Why are we discussing this topic today? Well, Laurent already mentioned uh, the grid and he talked about uh, marks with a 
one time glory that are no longer used. He talked about a second life. I do want to make clear that despite this being a digital encounter, we are not actually talking about second life nor Linden dollars. We are just talking about a possible second life of what was once a reputed trademark, which um, is no longer used, at least not for the original products, for whichever reasons. There can be commercial reasons or generational reasons, geopolitical reasons, um, or developments in science, or in fashion, in taste. Um, there can be lots of many reasons why a trademark owner would stop using a trademark. And um, then they sit out there. Some of them are registered, not necessarily. They might have expired in the meantime. And uh, from a US perspective, you would call about abandonment, right? The marks have been abandoned by the original owner. And then, um, you know, somebody else comes and finds them. I just would like to give you a few examples just to make it a little more to illustrate a little. So you find examples for uh, vintage brands. Some call them zombie brands. That's also quite illustrative. Um, in, in the car field, and you know, for example, Simca is a good example of a once pretty well-known car brand, which then was no longer used. Um, also, there was actually no Fiat 500 for a really long time until that was revived by the original owner. Um, Mini didn't take quite that long to be revived, but not by the original owner. So the, from the car area, we know a few examples. And then there are other examples. Um, I had a hard time finding global examples, but many will have known the treats. Treats were like Mars M&Ms, um, and existed alongside M&Ms for a while, but then they were phased out uh, in the 80s. And um, there is an ongoing battle over the trademark treats between Mars, the original owner who stopped using that in the 80s, and the ones that use it now that belong to the Katjes group. Um, there are issues in several countries. So we're going already to the legal side of things. So the problem from a legal perspective is that these marks uh, might still have some goodwill or not. It's part of the questions that we need to discuss. Um, and they're out there and they might be attractive and then somebody else goes and picks them up and starts using them. And the original owner doesn't have any trademark protection anymore because these marks either have already expired or they're vulnerable to cancellation. And we all know that in the EU, especially now that we have administrative proceedings everywhere, right? Cancellation of a trademark due to non-use is easy and inexpensive for the cancellation applicant. So they're kind of not really worth the paper they're on. And um, so then the question is, can the owner or maybe the successor of the original owner do something about that, about that third party picking up that earlier mark? Um, and I would like this to be focused not only on the registration. When we talk about bad faith, it's not so much about use, it's about registration, at least the way we understand that. Use is also interesting. So, you know, one thing is to be able to cancel the registration by the junior user. And another thing is to actually put an end to the use of the earlier mark. So that's the mm -hmm. concept that we're going to talk so, about. Yeah, so vintage brands are, can still maybe be registered, but they also may have just been expired uh, in, in the sense that uh, they can now be prone to be uh, cancelled or they already have been stopped being used, uh, if I understand you correctly. Philip, can you further elaborate on, on that vintage marks concept from your perspective? So I see vintage, in fact, is a word which is a pos has positive connotation, you know, something which has been uh, on the market before, which is old, but uh, it's today becomes a fashion again. You no, know? it is, can be old or it can be as well imitate the old. You no. Know? Uh, so I wonder where do I get these cases in my EOIPO proceedings? Uh, I have them in absolute grounds. I had this Volkswagen bully case, but this is something different. I have relative grounds cases, obviously, where someone has still some trademark eventually open for revocation or a dread for proof of use, or he has an unregistered right. Uh, he has maybe the adequate trademark for similar goods. 
yeah, the Hispano-Suiza case to see to what extent uh, goods are still similar in light of confusion between watches and cars. Uh, and then we have these <clears throat> um, cases of proof of use. We have this case, we have vintage trademarks and proof of use. For example, someone coming with a referring to spare parts. And in fact, these to vintage spare parts. And I understand that vintage spare parts are old spare parts, are second hand spare parts. So if someone has a trademark, which maybe has expired or which maybe is not or is open for revocation and is still valid. And he refers simply to second and spare parts. It depends very much if, in fact, he is the one who distributes and uses the trademark as a reference to his origin or someone you know, and trademark as function of origin or to describe, in fact, that um, he has a second hand. He knows where to buy second-hand products and so on. No? We had a proof for proof of use can be tricky if the owner of the trademark in fact refers to publicity of third parties with whom he has no connection. I had uh, well, I, I have seen several decisions of participate in several decisions. In this context, certainly we cannot get around Testarossa judgment. The Court of Justice has taken this very important judgment, which somehow as well uh invents a thing new concepts and was not taken with the help of an advocate general but i thought it was a pity because uh, it is a complex case it has complex uh, concepts new concepts i think in part mm -hmm. and today for example the court of justice said yes an owner of a trademark can also sell used products second-hand products you will not see that very often, but you have, for example, cars, you know, which are bought back by the proprietor and then, for example, cleaned, washed, repaired, receive a certification and so on, and then placed by the same proprietor on the market again. I just heard that, for example, Rolex does it. Rolex now as well wants to intervene on the second hand market by giving a guarantee that this is a real Rolex without any uh, with all, all the ingredients, with all the parts uh, as originals. Okay. And uh, obviously, so, in second, Testa Rosa is very important, no? the, the very important market because the brand is very valuable. Yeah. Philip, I think you're touching already on, on, on a lot of topics that uh, are already going very much in detail. I hope that we can we will come back to these judgments um, in much more detail. Uh, but maybe at the beginning, it would be important still to highlight. So you are saying that the question really also depends a bit on is there still some sort of use uh, even in a spare part sense, or is there no use anymore? Uh, and I think that is an, indeed an important question I want to uh, address in a little bit more detail. But before we do so, um, I still have heard you, yeah, I see these cases coming to the office and I actually wonder like, you know, well, well, maybe not wonder, but it is a bit remarkable that we see a little bit more of that vintage brands being now uh, uh, addressed uh, at the office and, and the court. So. Um, you know, Annette, maybe do you have any idea or what is your idea uh, about the question why this has become more relevant during the recent years? Yeah, I understand that this has become more relevant. Uh, I mean, this is obviously the reason why we have this this encounter. Uh, I have to say that personally, I'm, I'm not so much involved in, in, in practice that I could judge uh, whether that is, is actually or whether these are a few scattered cases that we have seen or whether it is a um, a, a real trend. If it is a real trend, and I just submit this now, uh, then of course there are several, well, the, the reason for that must be that there are markets for that. There is an increased market demand. Now, m m one reason for, for the fact that more people are trying to satisfy that market demand is that it's, it has become easier through electronic means to actually spot uh, those markets by, I, I don't know, analyzing the number of searches for vintage brand on the internet or by screening social media for chat groups about of, uh, old car enthusiasts, uh, etc. Um, so, so all of that that is possible. I, but I was thinking that maybe there is also a, a, a deeper reason for that. Maybe um, 
uh, I mean, all of, uh, or one of many many of these ca uh, cases are about cars. So maybe it's it's also a kind of nostalgia. People are wanting to go back to cases when everything was more safe and secure, when riding a car was uh, was luxury, was glamorous. So that that's that's a, a counter program to the times that we are now living in that are very complicated, that are troublesome for many reasons, but the future is not so rosy anymore. So uh, maybe uh, there is a kind of sociological reason also behind this, and maybe that could also impact uh, the assessment of bad faith. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason maybe also you mentioned technology as well eh? uh, as a as an e maybe easier means of finding these old um, uh, brands that are uh, uh, yeah from the past let's say do you think that that really uh, has also impacted the 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 raise or rise of of these cases uh, i don't know uh, Verena or Philip um Yeah, I can. We, I, you know, I'm not uh, known to be terribly active in social media, or, or you know, and I never actually was in Second Life, nor have I been to the metaverse yet. But um, one could see consumer products being more easily reproduced in the metaverse virtually than in real life. It takes a whole different set of uh, logistics to produce to put an actual product on the actual market than to create it virtually. So one could see that issue being replicated and in fact multiplied in mm -hmm. the in what we now all refer to as the metaverse. And I'm glad you asked that because at least we've said the buzzword now. Yeah. <laughs> Necessary But for every trademark talk to have metaverse in it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Philip, uh, yeah, just, it, I mean, what do you just think? Just to add. Sorry. Sorry, just just to add yeah. uh, to what Verena said, I think we need to differentiate eventually. If we talk about use by the proprietor, for example, of secondhand products, because they are secondhand products, they are old products like old timers. There we probably talk about expensive, refined, um, complex products like watches, luxury watches, luxury cars, and so on. Then we have the other situation when we have third parties want to reinvent a new trademark, want to start a new business, and they look for a trademark which is already there, eventually has already a reputation, which is still known by someone and on which they can build a story on which they can build as well, and a reputation eventually as well on their the new product. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I also thought like, you know, it's also an easy way potentially to bring your product to the market if, uh, if an old Uh, mark that is not registered anymore, uh, but still has some kind of reputation, right? And I think that's also where uh, I'm. Uh, I'm thinking we we should discuss this a little bit more, um, because in the legal sense under trademark law, if you are not using the mark, you are in fact prone to be cancelled, right? So that's uh, cancellation after five years in the European Union, uh, you can be cancelled. And that's, uh, of course, legitimate if you don't use it. So the question is, if these brand owners, former brand owners, because that's what I understood from your first answers uh, about vintage marks, in fact, they have stopped using it and thereby they are prone to be cancelled or they have already expired. So Where does the line lie if Philip, for example, talks about spare parts for more complex products? There is still some use here of the brand, but not of the, the, the product, the complex product itself. Will that still be sufficient to show use under EU law, Philip? Do you, can you uh, maybe add very, a little bit on that? Yes, in, uh, you remember this old Minimax case. Uh, mm -hmm. Minimax was a, a brand, a trademark in the Netherlands, Uh, for fire extinguishers, they did not produce fire extinguishers. I understand that the fire extinguisher is quite difficult to break because the the corpse is very solid, and uh, the Minimax company still produced spare parts. However, they did not have a protection for spare parts, and another person and another company, German company of the same name, came and asked for revocation of this trademark. And there, and some people said it was like a pit. A, pity judgment, a judgment where the court of justice showed certain pity with the party and said, look, if it is used for spare parts, it may be used for the product itself, mm -hmm. which to some extent is weird because the regulation says uh, 
you must use the goods and service for which the trademark is registered. How can the use for spare parts uh, mean the use of the whole product? So therefore, the question was asked again in the Testarossa judgment, thinking that a car is far more complex than a fire extinguisher, obviously. And then the Court of Justice repeated, um, they said it is not important whether the spare parts are also registered by the proprietor. And they gave, they repeated the same um, uh, concept. I personally did not meet a lot of these cases, luckily, because I find it unclear when, or at least to see what the Court of Justice meant when it says that it's for common component parts that are integral to the makeup or structure of such goods or for goods or services directly, directly connected with the goods previously sold and intended to meet the needs of customers of these goods. This can be anything, but it cannot be that you have consumables and you show by some consumables the uh, use for the whole car. A car is much more complex. So, mm, mm, okay. difficult, no? Yes. Difficult question. I'm not aware of a lot of case law on that. Yeah. I, yeah. Nor am I. And I actually think that shows, I mean, of course, the Testarossa judgment, uh, you know, gave rise to a lot of discussion and interest uh, because it is an interesting case and it's a very interesting decision, uh, very exceptional for some of the reasons that you said. Um, but it's it doesn't show that that's not a reflection of what's out there in the marketplace. It's not common for trademark owners to stop using the mark and then to have use for spare parts. And, you know, this is very specific to the luxury car market, I would say, or perhaps the car market more generally speaking, but not, you know, not your usual brand. How many car brands have we compared to everything else? You, you wouldn't find pharma spare parts, or, you know, and certainly delivery of pharmaceuticals and uh, whatever uh, health advice would not maintain a pharma mark, just to mm. give yeah. that example. Okay, or di so I, dietary I, I... advice and chocolates. <laughs> because we, we well, know so many yeah. chocolate cases on the in the vintage brand area. <laughs> And I guess the, the Court of Justice would probably say that all of this depends on whether the, the use still serves the uh, original or the essential function of the trademark. And as long as I have delivered these spare parts in case of fire extinguishers and cars, so I agree it's a very specific case. But in these cases, it may be true to say, OK, uh, these parts are delivered in order to keep the, the those things going, to keep them on the market in in, uh, in accordance with, their, with, their main, with the main function of the trademark, I guess. Yeah. So I, I, I hear some criticism uh, of some, uh, some of the uh, maybe decisions, but I also hear that indeed we need to be cautious that to, to not generalize this for, for all sorts of vintage brands. This is a very specific uh, situation with the cars uh, and actually genuine use is really to check is their use in the trademark function way. Uh, and so there will be the answer for some, there is not, right? So there, uh, we, we, we can discuss like there are situations where there can be genuine use and then uh, there is legitimate protection, arguably, um, but for others there won't be. So then, of course, still, because this is the topic today, this is vintage brands that they are maybe not used anymore, right? Still, people are now saying there should be protection. And I really wonder uh, how should we justify this? What is the interest of those former vintage brand owners that, that they can bring up the reasons to still get protection. Um, maybe, Annette, would you like to um, tell us your opinion about this? Yeah, obviously there there is an interest of the uh, former trademark holder, uh, especially, well, very obviously when uh, the, the, the the brand is uh, the same as the family name, that is the uh, the case that we had in, in Ihera, but that's again a very special case. But there is probably a case, uh, an interest of, uh, well, being, um, being participating, at least to participate in the reputation which probably still exists. And there's maybe also an interest on the side of consumers uh, in the authenticity of what is sold under that trademark. Uh, and there may also be a kind of public interest in, I don't know, the uh, functioning of, uh, of, of, of competition uh, in a fair manner, or maybe even a kind of interest in 
uh, when, when, a, when a brand has been so fam world famous that it is a, a kind of quasi cultural uh, icon. So there may be a lot of uh, uh, interest that which probably all have to take to be taken into account, but not to forget, there is definitely also the interest of the applicant who has spotted again a kind of commercial chance, who wants to satisfy a market demand uh, and uh, who wants to do that by reviving the old brand. So what we're talking about here is a mixture of a lot of interests that need to be calibrated, that need to be balanced against each other. And I think it's obvious that there can't be one kind of solution that fits all, but that there must be a case-by-case -case, uh, analysis that takes account of all these different interests. What I want to say, however, is that the interest of the former trademark holder alone, mm -hmm. as such, to uh, be able to capitalize or to, 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 to reserve uh, the use of that brand to him or herself is certainly not sufficient to satisfy uh, that there is a kind of residual uh, uh, protection in the sense that anyone who would uh, want to register that mark uh, is considered to be in bad faith. I think that is clear and I think that has also been pronounced by the courts and, and, and boards that have dealt with these cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will we will come to the more specific conditions for finding bad faith indeed. Uh, but I mean, one can argue they, they are still reputation, there is still goodwill. If there is. is. Is that the reason why we should uh, consider the, the, the interests of vintage mark owners? Well, it's it's the main reason why the whole issue arises, not why we should consider it. Because uh, they're, they're, you said before that the the reviver, so, so to say, the person who finds the unused mark and decides to revive it uh, might be interested in the reputation. That may be true, but it, there, are, there can be other advantages from taking an older, now unused mark. For example, that it has been cleared, that it's available and that nobody else has it. So in other words, you have to do less trademark clearance if you adopt a mark that is registered, that nobody seems to be using and you start using it. it. In all likelihood, there is not a third party that's actually interested in it. Mm -hmm. So if you find a mark and you see the owner isn't using it, normally the conclusion is, okay, it's good to go, right? And then um, reputation is also, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, it can be a reputation that only the the reviver perceives, and uh, Annette already mentioned the Nehera case, maybe just to shed a little light on this, this was a, a Czechoslovakian fashion brand from the 20s and 30s, uh, famous back in the day, revived in the 2000s um, by a Slovakian person who, as a fashion you know, interested person, knew of the old Nehera brand, but it came out in the at the end of the day that you know, there was no mention of a wide reputation of that brand these days in, in Czechia or in Slovakia. And so, um, you know, but this guy knew about it. In other words, there can be some emotional attachment, some of the nostalgia reasons that uh, Annette mentioned on the part of the revivor, but not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, known to the general public. So there can be other reasons. But of course, the, the diverging reasons is the typical case would be there is some remaining goodwill, residual goodwill or whatever, whatever you want to call it. And yes, that makes it a jumping board for the launch of a new product, which makes it easier because it's easier to get across that PR message. Here's the new this and that. But, you know, the deception and then we all know of lots of cases where vintage brands have been revived by the very owners, usually by selling them to China or India. You know, just think of Volvo. Well, Volvo wasn't vintage at the time, but it's Chinese now. And, and um, or Saab it, and Rover, you know, they're Indian. Who knows that? Uh, Lambretta is Indian. Triumph motorcycles are Japanese, I think. So, you know, they're mm -hmm. authentic old British brands that everybody looks up to. So we have to we have to be realistic about this and who does what at the end of the day, it's who gets to cash in, right? If mm -hmm. there is a reputation, who gets to cash in? And is that monopolized by the former owner just because he at some point built up the goodwill maybe decades ago? Or is the third party free to grab it because it's out there? That's really, yeah. I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah. 
I think there's also the public domain uh, argument here, you know, when you when you don't use it anymore, you give up your right and then everybody else should have the chance to get it or not, uh, Philip, what, what do you yeah, think? So, uh, exactly. Testarossa judgment, the Court of Justice said, said it again clearly. Proof of use does not only serve to have less problems at the UIPO and less proceedings, for the trademark owners, proof of use as well is there to get rid of trademarks from the register which are not used anymore and not only get rid of them but as well get rid of them in order to allow third parties to register the same sign. Mm -hmm. So in exactly. principle, the principle is there, no? Uh, uh, the, they are in the public domain and everybody is free to grab. Yeah. This is the principle, no? So that, I guess, is uh, why uh, or when when then the question comes up, OK, apparently trademark law does offer a tool, namely bad faith, uh, as a possibility for uh, yeah, validating an application of this second brand, the revivers, uh, as Verena uh, put it. Uh, Philip, can you maybe tell us a little bit about under which conditions? Can you make as currently as this, the law stands with the recent case law that you already have mentioned, of course, but maybe briefly summarize again for us what is the current state of art regarding a successful bad faith application? Uh, sorry, a bad faith invalidation of an application in a case where the reviver tries to revive a vintage mark. You know that uh, bad faith is normally the last resort when you don't have any other rights, and uh, so therefore. Uh, we had two main cases. One is the Simca case, and the other case is the Nehera case. Both had different outcomes. In the uh, Simca case, a uh, person uh, registered the trademark, even though um, Renault Peugeot had still um, a trademark, even though they didn't use it. And somehow it was like, well, in short, what we always have to do is to see if it is a pirate or not, if the behavior is that of a pirate or if it is honest uh, behavior. No? You you need to you to try to, to see whether there is a commercial logic, whether there is a clear attempt to uh, use the trademark in a way which is not in the trademark function, if it uses for third parties. For example, you register a trademark and then ask a ransom sum, uh, an amount of money to the real proprietor in order to transfer the trademark, this speaks in favor of bad faith. Now, in the Nehera case, um, this was not the case. Uh, there, the um, uh, reputation was entirely, uh, um, how do you say, um, abandoned. No, they, there was no reputation anymore, really, um, that could be demonstrated on the marketplace. If you look for it, if you were an expert, maybe yes, but um, in fact, most people had forgotten that name and um, the mm -hmm. family members uh, that uh, requested the protection of the trademark against on the basis of bad faith against uh, the new proprietor did not manage to, to demonstrate, in fact, nor that there was any unfair uh, free riding on the reputation of the family that he tried to, to say that it's uh, that he's part of the family, that he has the good genes, um, know that he wanted to otherwise profit really. What he wanted, what he made clear in his publicity is that he went a tribute to, that he was, that um, he wanted to revive uh, certain things. And this was then uh, sufficient to see that this was not a pirate, this was not um, a way to profit unduly of that old reputation. Summarized very much, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, well, uh, so if I if I understand correctly, there is obviously a, a need for some continued reputation that is still there, right? That's otherwise the a bad faith application will not uh, invalidity uh, action will not will not be successful, correct? Normally, yes. I mean, you can always think of uh, strange uh, further um, uh, situations, but in principle, this is the rule. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Like uh, the, the, the idea of free riding, no? If if you if someone really wants to free ride on something, if the goodwill is lost somehow, then you cannot really free ride it. The fact that you want to construct construe a story of the brand to say that yeah, there was already the twenties and the thirties, and then it was abandoned is something different. 
Mm -hmm. But can I chime in here? Sure. Because Go because we, we're, we're straight in media's race. And, and the question to me is, is free riding per se bad faith? And I would challenge that. And that seems to come out in the Nehera judgment, even by the general court. At the end of the day, that bad faith action failed because there was no reputation. But the, the underlying understanding is that if there still had been a reputation, there would be parasitism, free riding and all that. And then we have bad faith. And there, I think mm -hmm. the conclusion is too quick because we have a way of addressing free riding in the protection for reputed brands that still enjoy protection for the uh, legitimate owner. Here we have free riding on some goodwill from some time ago and somebody who's no longer doing anything with it. And mm -hmm. I don't think that one can one can say that that just because it is a nice business opportunity, you could call it also called it that just because of that, you know, commercial vehicle, <laughs> somebody can necessarily be considered uh, to have acted in bad faith. And I, I'm a little concerned that that seems to be where the case law goes. Um, SIM car was still in the SIM car case. There were a lot of additional um, issues. For example, the guy had actually worked at uh, Peugeot. You know, there was an 18 month contractual relationship. And then there was the attempt to extort money from the actual trademark owner to get the mark back. On the other hand, the guy had been using SIM car since 2008 for bicycles and was mm -hmm. unchallenged. That's another point. One that wasn't much discussed, at least not before the court. Um, but it's an interesting, all of these cases are always interesting in all their ramifications. I'm yeah. just concerned about an automatism that mm -hmm. free riding means bad faith, because I think that mm -hmm. goes too far. And it's not, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a dishonest yeah. intention. Yeah, I hear you say possibly we are using a trademark tool here that goes too far or that is in interpreted in a way that goes rather far. And so I also wonder maybe um, is there a, is that the right tool to use or do we have any other tools that actually for such an owner of a vintage brand who doesn't use it anymore, so shouldn't have registration, shouldn't have the protection that that is uh, connected to the trademark that still he can claim. Um, Annette, do you have any uh, ideas about uh, the about other tools that could be used? Um, well, um, as long as we talk about trademark law, that would be difficult. I mean, of course, theoretically, one could also use a, a subparagraph G about uh, marks that are that deceive the public, but uh, mm -hmm. th this will hardly ever be be the case. I mean. Uh, as Verena just said, I mean, we are so used to uh, brands that are tradition brands to have past hands. I mean, there are completely different owners nowadays and uh, still uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the brand is, is considered as genuine as long as the person who is the owner of the brand takes uh, rep takes uh, responsibility for the goods that are marked by, by the brand. So, I mean, we accept that, uh, that, that that's one of the of the tenets of, of trademark law, that, that uh, trademark can can travel from one hand to the other. So why should we care about that and, and consider that to be de deceptive to consumers uh, if it is someone who is actually uh, unrelated to the former owner if that person picks up a brand which is actually uh, in the public domain. So I don't see a possibility to use any other uh, to, to use uh, uh, subparagraph uh, small g. Uh, concerning bad faith, I have first to say that I very much second uh, uh, what Verena has said, we shouldn't be so quick uh, and there shouldn't be an automatism about considering everybody who actually has an intention to participate uh, in a, a residual uh, reputation as a free rider whose actions must be must be prohibited and and and, and must be barred. We should really think a little bit more. Uh, uh, deeper. I mean, why why do we want to uh, to to prohibit that? Because after all, the brand is free, and again, this person has spotted a market demand and responds to it. That as such is not is not bad. But I fear, having said that, and saying that I really agree with uh, with uh, Verena in principle, I, I I can see that there is a certain automatism in the trademark law as it has developed. That if mm -hmm. you can. Um, if, if there are manifest indications that there is an intention to free ride, that is to participate in reputation, that that is then something which is considered as bad. Uh, under trademark law in the, uh, in the 
aspect un, under the aspect of bad faith. Of course, not uh, un, under uh, the trademark protection against uh, taking unfair advantage that is gone if the mark is no longer there but it can come back as one of the uh, the elements that would be considered uh, in in the context of of that phase so again i see a certain logic from the way of thinking of of uh, yeah of, of from the structure of eu law how it is has been interpreted it's very often so that it, the um, uh, the defining of free riding is immediately considered as being something bad, not just uh, in the context of an existing trademark, but I think that also translates into the area where we are no longer in trademark law proper, but where we come into something which is closer to unfair competition law. Personally, I don't find that uh, very convincing. And if I may add that, and, and then I stop, um, uh, even if uh, there is a certain logic in considering free riding uh, as something bad, uh, then mm -hmm. there still must be the possibility of uh, arguing on the basis of defending oneself on the basis of uh, um, due cause. And here we could come back to the motives, for instance, to uh, to, to to let um, the trademark survive. So so the, mm -hmm. the question actually is, is it really only free uh, uh, somebody who is free riding or is he a good uh, Sam Samaritan who uh, keeps a mark alive for which is, there is a certain uh, a, a certain mm. uh, demand, and that's that's really I think the, the the question which is decisive in these cases. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Philip, I want to give you the chance to also react, but if uh, if you don't have any, you know, uh, immediate, you would like to. Yes. Yes, um, please go ahead. Um, obviously, we need as well to have this subjective part. We need to have this will somehow to harm the other side. Um, but it's true that in Nehera, it said that this free riding would be in order to benefit from its power of attraction, its reputation and its prestige, and without any financial compensation and without having to make any efforts of its own in that regard to exploit the commercial effort expended by the proprietor or user of that sign of the name in order to create and maintain the image of that sign or of that name. So yeah, it's true that the free riding is an important part, but mm, this somehow hurts with the other principle the Code of Justice says, mm, in principle, they are in the public domain. Mediation, I just make a quick publicity <laughs> for the mediation service of the Board of Appeal. Uh, maybe mediation or maybe people try to settle these bad faith cases uh, amicably and to see to what extent uh, they should be compensated for some good way if there is still some. Yeah. Because on the other side as well, it is an advantage for a company that does not use its trademark anymore still to obtain at least something sure. for the trademark, uh, for the goodwill, yeah. I mean, for the goodwill, not for the trademark, but for the goodwill he has constructed if it is still worth something. I think that's a nice uh, uh, comment to make before we actually now move to the questions um, because we have quite a few. So uh, I'll I'll start with one here um, where basically it's stated that um, there is of course the five year period uh, of genuine use um, in which the trademark has to have been used uh, unless uh, and otherwise it would be prone to be cancelled. But the question here is, in your opinion, how long shall the reuse last to minimize or eliminate the risk of revocation? Uh, so, I don't think there's a, there's a single answer to this. It depends on whether the reuse is genuine. Right. Mm -hmm. And it can be very short as long as it's genuine. Now, of course, if you once every five years launch uh, the relaunch the product for three days, probably that's not genuine use of the trademark, but it's merely made to maintain the mark. But I'm saying probably maybe it is. So there is no single answer to this question. How but long should the reuse be? Verena, you focus now on the on the volume of exploitation and but what is important is well that it's used as a trademark. You now that somehow really it's still, re, it's not. It does not only describe. Look, um, this is a that and that brand, but it needs to show something that the, the that the person, the company selling it, still again takes the responsibility of the product. To build and maintain a market share, we should always. That's for the, the use uh, product. That no? was this probably the number one best thing the Court of Justice ever said. You know, it's an easy um, and much better definition of genuine use than not token, <laughs> because you know, not token, not token doesn't use. tell you yeah. much, but building and maintaining a, 
a market share. Um, mm -hmm. So if if you if you launch a product, you know, for three days, once every five years, probably you're not really maintaining a market share. What you're maintaining is a trademark. Yeah. <laughs> There is another question here on this, but um, Annette, do you want to go on to the on on that topic as well? No, 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 no. I think that, no. that was perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. But it, there is a follow up here because the question is also there is the difficulty with products like car and motorbikes where a term of five years of non-use may be too short to the subject uh, to be subject to revocation due to one high cost of production and second relatively long lives of the products. Obviously, the statutes do not differentiate uh, between products, but maybe in some products also COVID-19 may be used as a justification for non-use during some period of time. So that's, I think, again, a bit of a broader question, more general, um, but uh, somehow related, of course, also to vintage marks, like how long uh, would be a good period if five years may be too short for some? Well, I guess uh, I guess Sorry. we need a, 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 a clear cut a type of, of non-use. So we cannot have a la carte types of no. uh, uh, yeah, use periods. But I think uh, no, I, I think this is a very interesting question, and it connects to some, uh, something that we have addressed when we were talking about. Uh, I mean, Philip was talking about the Minimax and the fire extinguisher, and also we were talking about uh, the, the the cars, Testarossa, uh, where uh, there seems seems indeed a certain logic, again, behind this uh, definition of genuine use being used that keeps a product on the market with its market share. Um, uh, for for long-lived products, that is that has it has has a dif dif uh, different implications uh, than for very short-lived products. So, uh, I mean, we have discussed this in the context of maybe in some instances or in some cases uh, the, the the sale of uh, used goods and uh, um, spare parts may actually be enough to maintain the use right that was different from from this particular question which was about the period of of uh, of, of, of non-use but um, the same problem namely the uh, difference uh, differences with regard to the, the the life of products may come out with regard to what I what what counts as genuine use and again with uh, with regard to these long-lived products sale, selling of spare parts may be a way of maintaining mm -hmm. The mark, which would maybe not be the case for other types of product. Any other views on on the length of the period? What, when it comes to the COVID, I mean, the, 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 the you know the question addressing the COVID pandemic and mm -hmm. that for some products, I would say, and particularly services, having a harder time being marketed for a while. Of course, you always have the proper reasons for non-use. Um, we also all know that the pharma industry particularly has to tackle the five-year period because they have to very carefully time when do they apply and how fast can they then actually get to the market and then mm -hmm. you know they're also being looked at uh, rather meticulously when it comes to whether they actually have proper reasons so of course there are some industries that are particularly affected by this um, all, but I agree with Annette. We need a clear rule, and and it's, there's no point in differentiating between one product or the other. And in the context of vintage brands, when it comes to cars, I mean they already were on the market, so you can't really talk about production is slow and expensive and so on. It yeah. was there, you stopped using it, maybe because the car was just out of date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Philip, anything on this one? I mean, the proper reasons for non-use are there as well. Uh, normally, we don't use them if uh, they have uh, economic, if the company has economic problems. But as uh, Verena said, uh, a certain service which you can render because um, you need to be at home cannot be rendered. But maybe then as well, mm -hmm. the period of COVID was not long enough, no, in order not to at least have prepa preparation of uh, going to the marketplace, which as well can eventually uh, help you out already as well. Yeah. I mean, you don't need to have it used intensively. It's not about having, we don't judge the commercial success. What we yeah. want to know is if you have the market share or if you try to obtain a market share. Yeah. I think we have a very nice, Another question here. Um, 
The German Trademark Act treats trademarks which have been applied for in bad faith as an absolute ground of refusal, which should be examined ex officio by the German Patent Office. And the question is, do you see a public enforcement gap at the EU IPO and or other IP offices where bad faith is examined as ex is, is examined or is not examined ex officio? Sorry. So it, in Germany, it is at the EU IPO. It's not, but only on request uh, of an interested party. So I think that's a that's a good question. Uh, is that an enforcement gap? So the directive uh, foresaw the possibility for the member states to have the bad faith as an option for absolute grounds for refusal or only invalidity at the DOIPO. The legislator chose to have it only in invalidity. I understand that in Germany or in the other countries where they may have a bad faith as an absolute ground for refusal, it doesn't work very well. They hardly ever refuse anything on that basis. Mm -hmm. Hardly ever. I think one or two, no, by Bayern Munich, uh, brought by a private person uh, for football thing. Yes. I think something like that, no? But normally they don't apply it at the, in the national offices. Okay. Exactly. It has to be. Yeah, awesome. Sorry. Yeah. Annette. Yeah, no, I, I just have to, to, to say that uh, it's true. I mean, the, uh, this came into the act. Uh, I mean, first of all, there is, of course, the, the, the option, as Philip said, under the directive. And uh, the uh, rule in the, the German trademark act came, came uh, into the act for very specific reasons. There were specific cases when people had been very, very upset about the registration of uh, names of very famous persons um, uh, just in order to, to, to make money. It was about Johann Sebastian Bach, the, the famous composer. Uh, somebody had registered uh, that name as a trademark in order to make money uh, because they knew that a Bach festival was uh, was coming up uh, that was organized by the city of Leipzig. But So there was a very, very specific uh, reason and indeed, in practice, it doesn't really work so well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I mean, we, um, if I may say so, when uh, you, you, you may know that in the Max Planck Institute, together with Alexander von Mühlendahl and Roland Knapp, we have been writing a report on the preparation of the, the trademark law reform, and we have been thinking about uh, this this point uh, quite a bit, and we um, we we thought that. In a way, it doesn't make much sense to have bad faith as an ex officio uh, ground for refusal because the office will hardly ever know about somebody having bad faith. You need uh, you need to to be uh, told some details from from other people who know more of the backgrounds of of this whole thing. But we thought that maybe it makes sense to have it as a as an up as a relative ground for refusal. Uh, so uh, not an absolute ground to be uh, considered ex officio, but uh, a relative ground that can be argued before the registration is actually effected so that it uh, you don't have to go for cancellation, but you can stop the whole thing before the registration. So that was the kind of compromise that we cons considered. You Which didn't make, make it in the law. You like a situation like if someone applies for Neymar trademark and it's not Neymar, you ask for the signature that he's authorized to apply for Neymar, which would make sense as well on the one side. No? Mm. Okay. Yeah, but there may be other obvious cases. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, but, no, but it has to be really obvious. And who says there's only one Neymar in the world? You know, yeah. just because <laughs> that happens to be a famous football player doesn't necessarily give him the monopoly to this term. Not necessarily. Fine. I'm not saying it doesn't. And I know he won the case or the mark was cancelled. I remember. But... But no, I think that goes too far. So it has to be so on the face of it obvious that, and I wouldn't even say it doesn't work well. I'm just saying it has a, a limited room for application. That doesn't necessarily mean it works badly. It just means that, as Annette says, it's not the appropriate forum for ruling. And it, but I, I think we go too far into the direction of. Can the mark be registered? Can it not be registered? Can it be cancelled? Can it not be cancelled? And we completely forget about the marketplace. So one of the things that you know really made me very interested in the Nehera case was that they have an open boutique in Vienna, and nobody was even doing anything about that. There's no case pending in Austria whether they can use or not Nehera. It was only about the registration. What's the point? I mean, really, you know, we, we, of course, all deal with the EU IPO and the registrations, and it's all very important. But to the normal people out there, that's completely irrelevant, what is on the register, what's not on the register. What matters is what is on the market. And I think if you have an overly broad interpretation of bad faith when it comes to registration, which is not matched by actual litigation tools concerning the use, you have a 
big dichotomy between what we all lawyers talk about when it comes to registration and in, in the marketplace and tools to address that. And I think that that's, of course, so much more complex. We can't really address that in its entirety, but, you know, unfair competition, passing off and so on and so on. There are things that can yeah. be discussed. I think that's a valid remark to make um, that actually we look at, should look also at the market. But um, if I may, because we are running a little bit out of time, but there is still an interesting uh, question here. I think we've partly uh, looked at it, but not yet that much. So um, there is an Austrian case where uh, a vintage mark was declared revoked on the basis of being misleading. And the question now again is under our absolute grounds of refusal, which have to be assessed uh, ex officio, we do have Article 71G misleading. I think Annette already touched upon this previously, but also well, Article 71F uh, public policy. And the question here is, as a bad, if, it, if it's a bad failing, it's arguably also contrary to public policy or misleading as in this Austrian case, which I don't know, but uh, maybe you do. Uh, so the question, of course, is, is there a, a potential here when there is a famous vintage mark that is applied for, uh, whether the office should look at it from a misleading and a public policy perspective? You remember well, still I, this wedding I, of um, Prince Charles and Lady Di, no? And you remember the, sh the, 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 the dress she had was from Elizabeth mm -hmm. Manuel. And then we had this case before the Court of Justice in which they went, which uh, Elizabeth Manuel said, look, I sold my name to the company and then I got out of the company and, um, and now it's deceptive because I'm not in the company anymore. And the Court of Justice said, this is not deceptive because the trademark can belong to one and the person can be different. We had the same situation with Fiorucci later as well. So I don't see it as deceptiveness. Mm -hmm. No, but um, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, Annette, go ahead, please. Let me say something. I, I have a disconnection between images and, and sound, so it's very difficult for me to see whether one can uh, come in or not. But thank you for, for, for letting me say this. I think the, the question can be uh, very nicely combined with uh, what Rita said uh, uh, a minute ago, because I think that that could be an, uh, an important thing to, to, to look at. Um, uh, let's make that, or that could be a test. I mean, uh, when talking about bad faith, one might uh, try to test whether it would be uh, against uh, unfair competition rules uh, to use that mark. If it is mm -hmm. against unfair competition rules, then arguably uh, it's it's something that that signals bad faith. Because I think that the bad faith element in this ground for refusal is actually a kind of there is a, a, a clear trajectory to what to 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 what is considered unfair competition. So that could be a, a test. The, the bad thing about this is that we don't have a uniform. Uh, unfair competition law in this regard in the EU because we don't have harmonization of B2B unfair competition. But still, it's it's I think it, it's at least a, a, a kind of a thought experiment. And that, at least on the national level, could also even literally translate into a ground for refusal because uh, there is an optional ground for refusal in the um, directive article for uh, paragraph three, uh, subparagraph A, uh, that um, countries can refuse registration of marks, the use of which can be prohi prohibited on other grounds than trademark law. So there, it, it would fit in, might fit in uh, uh, there if a country has such a rule. But again, it might also be a thought experiment uh, that one can use in order to find out whether there is actually something that could count as relevant to bad faith. And um, just the, the last th uh, uh, word, uh, Anke, you said that um, uh, uh, article uh, uh, or bad faith is more or less the same as a public policy, as something which is contrary to public policy. I wouldn't go that far because I think public policy is, is something which is really much more in the public interest, whereas when we talk about bad faith, it's more uh, like, or it can at least be something which is more under competition between entrepreneurs, which is uh, which is more on a uh, which, which is closer to to trademark law and and, and, and private relationships than a public uh, policy issue. Mm -hmm. The other the Austrian speakers, case, the Austrian case was not shared. I mean, I'm burning with interest. There was a mark that was declared invalid because it was deceptive. Interesting. Is that is that in the restaurant business? Yeah. There is a reference here. Uh, in the chat. 
revocation for deceptive use? Couldn't it be that? Because there is a special ground for revocation if the use was misleading in the way it was used, like we yeah. it was said the other day by La Irlandesa, no? Um, yeah. And this was as well mentioned in one of these judgments, I think in the Hera judgment as well. If they would register a trademark and use it in order to co confuse the person with another person and the use is done in a misleading way, then the trademark can be revoked. These are the cases are very rare. Mm -hmm. but exists as a legal basis. I, I would guess that the case was about that. But yeah, it's from the case. Supreme Court from 2021. Uh, there is the reference in the in the chat as well. So uh, for you, if you want to have a look at it. Uh, we are running out of time, but there is yeah. one last very nice question, I think, which we should discuss. Um, so the question here is, when we are looking at uh, uh, vintage marks, uh, have there been any court considerations or professional discussions on how the effects of vintage brands correlate with the existing definition of the informed user? So actually following what we just said, if there is misleading or confusion, it depends on what is the relevant public and will they not be aware of that there are vintage marks and that that may not be the same owner as used to be. I think that's what yeah. the question is about. No, so. Uh, I'm trying to figure yeah. out where the informed user comes in because that's of course a design no, that's, term. That's design. That's design. It's probably it was. It's it's about the uh, average think consumer, not average about the consumer. Is meant. Average yeah. consumer, right? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to I think, think maybe right. maybe that the person that asked this question or made this proposal actually was making no, a link it, between I, I design just, law and vintage brands, and I'm trying to make it less yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> not easy. Yeah. Yeah. But I think well, it's about the average. No, no consumer or the relevant public under trademark law, because there can be different uh, definitions we have in mind of that, of course, depending on the goods, depending on the knowledge of the relevant consumer group. Uh, and so so is there anything that we know about that? That how well, does the, the average consumer look at vintage brands? Well, I think the, the question uh, well, is I that, think that the answer has, has, has more or less already been given because we know this. I mean, Philip was completely right to to point to the uh, Elizabeth Emanuel uh, case. I mean, uh, not, normally uh, we don't say that there is any um, misconception in the mind of consumers if uh, brands have passed hence, uh, if the, the owner is no longer the one that we thought that uh, would be the owner of, of, of the brand in older times. So I, I don't think that uh, it would be consistent with the uh, usual application of the notion of uh, informed, uh, of, uh, of uh, average consumer if we deny uh, that there is a public uh, deception of the public in cases like um, Elizabeth Emanuel and uh, cases uh, like this when an old brand uh, is uh, used and maybe even registered for uh, another person who has um, who has no connections with the old owner. So I, I really would see an inconsistency there. But I may be wrong. Perfect. I think we need to be very careful building likelihood of confusion into bad faith. And there are some several decisions that have addressed the issue that likelihood of confusion is not a requirement for bad faith. Those are two different pairs of boots, and I think we should we should keep them apart. Um, of yeah. course, the likelihood of confusion, average consumer, and so on, or relevant consumer, I should say comes into play when we look at the questions that Annette discussed previously, namely what's the impact on the public and does an unfair competition aspect actually come into play, which may make a parasitic behavior that's that's actually bad faith more likely, not necessarily compulsory, but more likely. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Anyone still wants to say a final word or? Thank you. Well, thank, thank all you. of you for uh, an excellent discussion. Actually, I really enjoyed it. And uh, the topic, we, we discussed a lot of aspects. There's still lots of aspects that could be discussed, I think, afterwards. But um, I will hand over to uh, Manuel. And thank you again for offering us all the opportunity to have a fun hour of discussion. Thanks very much, Anke. Vintage, nostalgia, feelings sensations, emotions, reputation, opportunities, genuine, bad faith, free riding, uh, Verena, 
So what an exciting world, this world of the resurrection of the vintage Marx. Yeah. In fact, it is the real world. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I wonder whether this topic should be the entrance door to anyone who would like to know uh, about the beauty of the trademark system. Yeah. And you have presented it in, in such an exciting way. Yeah. Thanks. First of all, thanks very much to to Anke. Yeah, Anke, we we do appreciate your moderator skills. It was not indeed easy to govern such a wonderful team. Yeah, but knowing you very well, as I know you very well, I knew that you were going to do it splendidly. So there, Ned uh, and there, Verena, we are also very grateful to you both. And also we are very grateful to you, Philip. Uh, we understand very well, Philip, that it is not easy to be a member of the of the Boards of Appeal of EWIPO and to participate in this kind of debates. Of course, we all understand that you have spoken on your own behalf, that you didn't represent at any time the office. So Anke, Annette, uh, Philip, uh, Verena, be welcome to the unconscious family. Thank I have you. a feeling that we could have spent at least one hour more moving from one issue to another and that we would have loved uh, listening to you for many other hours. But, but believe me, you will be so surprised recognizing in the report uh, how many, many questions you have brought on the table in just one hour. Yeah? And these are the encounters. So many thanks also to all those uh, who have attended the encounter. Uh, I counted more than 100 today. Uh, also for those who ask questions to the panel. Uh, you know, I always tend to express here that we are very grateful to your fidelity towards the encounters, that we do appreciate very, very much any criticism, any suggestion, any advice you could provide to, to us for, for improving the encounters. You know, after 24 encounters, we are convinced that encounters constitute indeed a very, very valuable legacy for the future. And that this is a common legacy that belongs to all of us, the, the community of intellectual property. Uh, by the way, you will have at your disposal the report in some days, and here I would like to, be, to thank very specially today to, to Ariel Aberdeen and to Maurizio Krupi, to the new doctor Maurizio Krupi. Congratulations there, Maurizio. They will prepare the report for uh, all of you. So finally, thanks to FIDE and thanks to TIPSA. Uh, thanks most especially to Alvaro and to Cristina. Without you, behind the scenes, uh, this will not be functioning. And of course, thanks to all of you who uh, have been here, uh, those who have been so patient and so loyal to the encounters. So take care and join us, please, in less than one month. Uh, we do count on all of you for our next encounter. Our next encounter will be the 25th, uh, and we will discuss another fascinating topic, yeah? metaverse and intellectual property. So thanks for being with us. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Manolo.